Hello and good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the ISRF team to this webinar celebrating Kian O'Driscoll's recently published book, Victory, The Triumph and Tragedy of Just War. I will shortly be handing over to ISRF Director of Research, Chris Newfield, who will be hosting tonight's event. But before I do so, I'm quickly going to go over some housekeeping. We are using Zoom webinar this evening, which means that only panelists will have their cameras and microphones activated. We unfortunately do not have the facilities to do closed captions, but we will be able to send an automated transcript to anybody who would like to read through tonight's proceedings afterwards. If you'd like to ask a question during the Q&A session, please use Zoom's Q&A function. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which you can use to submit short questions for any of tonight's speakers. You can also read and upvote questions that other people have submitted there, uh, which you can use to indicate your interest in any particular questions. A curated selection of questions will be put to the panelists towards the end of the event. But please note that we may not have time to cover every question that was asked during the session. We're scheduled to run for about 75 minutes tonight, but we will certainly make sure that we have finished by 8.30 p.m. UK time. We are recording tonight's event and we aim to circulate a link to the resulting video to all attendees in the next week or so. Finally, we'll be sending around a feedback form tomorrow. And because this is only our third public webinar, we would be very grateful to hear from you about your experience. Okay, that's all from me. I'll now hand over to Chris Newfield to introduce the event and our speakers. Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this, as Lars just said, uh, the third in our series of discussions of books uh, written by ISRF fellows, um, all slated for the third Thursday of each month. Uh, some of you may have seen launches for Annalien de Dang's Freedom and Unruly History and our last one uh, for Oche Onazi's An African Path to Disability Justice. Uh, next month, we're going to have uh, Professor Kimberly Brownlee introducing her new book, Being Sure of Each Other, about relationships as social rights. In April, Dr. Gabor Shearing will discuss his new book, The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism and the Accumulative State in Hungary. Um, these monthly series are, is going to, it will carry on through July. Um, please see our website at isrf.org for further details. Um, I'm in the middle of my first year as the foundation's second director of research, as the foundation is about to turn 10 years old. And I'm quite impressed by the historical depth and or depending on the topic, the geographical sweep of the work uh, that ISRF fellows are doing. And today's book is a good example. Um, Keanu Driscoll's victory describes the necessity of just war theory in the process of criticizing all of its forms. None of us need reminding that in treating war, Professor Driscoll's book covers a central dynamic and apparently permanent crisis of contemporary life. He identifies crucial turning points in just war theory across more than 2000 years. And it's tempting to conclude this rather inviting book with the sense that humanity has made no progress ever at containing war, much less at ending it. I was reminded of my own struggles to come to terms with war in the United States. Uh, I missed the Vietnam War draft, but no one really knew when and whether that American war would end. And my grandfather, a veteran of a previous war, had promised my mother that were I drafted to go to Vietnam, he would smuggle me across the Canadian border himself. Years later, when I was first teaching at UC Santa Barbara, sometime in Bill Clinton's first term, I offered to design a new class called US Cultures of Peacetime. Once I sat down to read for the syllabus, I found that there were no US Cultures of Peacetime. The texts from these interwar periods were all about war turned inward, final conquest of indigenous lands after the Civil War, wars on black freed persons, then later wars on anti-war people, War on wars on drugs, but never actual peacetime with real devotion to social reconstruction. Not long after the Clinton period, there was 9-11 and the current period of permanent war now entering its 20th year. War without victory, war without end, 
and the continuous expansion of modes of military force, proxy force, cyber force, drone force, force projected over there. Uh, this kind of bleak premonition that I've just described is precisely what Professor O'Driscoll's book interrupts. He shows the intelligence of the history of thought about war's confinement and of the unending efforts to put sharp limitations onto the practice of war. The arguments he engaged Gages seemed to me to have made a difference in the reduction of war's scope, at least at times, and on war's influence on our societies. The same is true for his demonstration of the limits of just war theory itself. The book is a real pleasure for a non-expert like myself. It's compact because it's extremely careful about what gets in and what stays out. It is precise and so does not linger in the twists and turns of arguments, and it is encompassing in a way that allowed me to get a feeling for the whole narrative of the um, narrative arc of the theory of just war. The application of this kind of clear intelligence to this intractable topic made me hopeful actually by the end of the book that we do know how to stop killing each other and that we do, we do at least have the conceptual means to make ourselves stop. Um, so in the order of things here tonight, Kian is gonna give us an overview of his book our two commentators, Faye, Faye Donnelly and Neil Rennick, uh, will each speak for about five minutes or so. Kian will respond and then we'll open it up for questions. So at least half of our time, we'll uh, be entertaining the questions and ideas that you bring to us from the audience. Kian Driscoll, who will speak first, grew up in Limerick, Ireland, completed his PhD at the University of Wales, Aberystwyth, and has been a lecturer in politics at the University of Glasgow, but he is coming to us from Canberra, Australia tonight, where it is a bit after six o'clock in the morning tomorrow. So thank you, Kian, for, for getting up for us. Uh, he is currently an associate professor in the Department of International Relations at Australian National University, where he convenes the PhD program in the School of Asia Pacific Affairs. His main area of research is the intersection between normative international relations theory and the history of political thought with a particular focus on the ethics of war. He studies the development of the just, just war tradition over time and the role it plays in circumscribing contemporary debates about the rights and wrongs of warfare. In addition to the book we're discussing tonight, he's published another book called The Renegotiation of the Just War Tradition, which appeared in 2008 and has co-edited three volumes while publishing in a range of leading journals in international relations, security studies, and ethics and international affairs. In addition to being a 2019 ISRF fellow, which we are very proud, he was the PI on an ESRC project entitled Moral Victories. Kian, it's really a great pleasure to have you with us tonight. Good morning to everyone, or uh, I'm not sure whether I should say good morning or good evening. And in any case, greetings from Canberra. And thank you so much for giving up your time to join us this morning to everyone. Um, I suppose a few thank yous are in order before we get started um, talking about the book. Uh, so first up, I'd like to thank uh, Chris, Stuart, Lars, uh, Louise, and all the team at the ISRF uh, not only for arranging this event, but for their incredibly generous support over the past uh, few years. Uh, the ISRF is a, uh, I can honestly say, is a funder like no other, who um, essentially provided me with a pot of money to buy my time and said, go away and write your book and come back to us in a year and tell us what you've done. No strings attached, uh, no other requirements. Um, and I can't speak highly enough of uh, their supportiveness over that period of time. And so this book uh, really wouldn't have been uh, written without them. Um, thanks also to Faye and Neil who have kindly agreed to speak this morning. Um, I hugely enjoy uh, listening to Faye and Neil speak and, and take the opportunity to do so whenever I can. So having them here this morning is a real treat. Um, and I hope they got the memo that only softball questions are welcome. Um, thank you also to Dominic Byatt and his team at Oxford University Press. Um, Dominic was incredibly helpful during the production of this book, and I especially appreciated the way he stirred music tips from Fortet to Fela Kuti into his editorial notes. Tony Erskine and Ian Clark offered ongoing supervision long after the fact, 
um, and I benefited from several friends reading drafts. I won't name them now because we'd be here all night, but it, it really is true that it takes a, a village or at least a Just War Theory community to write a book. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I really benefited uh, during the writing of this book from having a strong team working with me on this project at Glasgow. Uh, Andy Hom, Phil O'Brien and Kurt Mills worked closely with me on this project. And I'm very grateful for all that they poured into our collective work on Victory, uh, but even more so for the fact that they made it enjoyable. Uh, getting started then, it's probably best that we kick off with a confession of errors and omissions. Um, I'll leave the most of them to Neil and Faye to, to pick up, but I'll own up to one straight away. Uh, the biography of Hugo Grotius on page 99 is mistaken. For anyone who cares to check, Grotius was not the son of a burger, spelled B-U-R-G-E-R, -E as it says there. I think the word I was looking for at the time was burger with an H. Um, so a big thank you to Dan Bully for gleefully pointing that one out to me. So with, uh, with that error aside, with that error out of the way, let me say a few words about the book itself then, or rather perhaps about where it came from. If I had to trace it to one insider impulse, probably a better word, I say that it came from my unease at the idea of being, or at least being seen to be, a just war theorist, um, quote unquote. There's only a fine line between writing about the just war tradition and championing it. And this made me, and still makes me in fact, quite uncomfortable. The situation would arise frequently that whenever I was invited to speak at an academic conference or, or, or at, a, at a seminar series, I would, um, think I was speaking about the just war tradition and offering a, a set of critical thoughts about it, only to find that I was, uh, when it turned to Q&A, defending the just war tradition and, and seen as somehow as its defender or champion. Um, this, as I said, made me feel somewhat uncomfortable. And that feeling has, has probably only grown in the last couple of years, especially as I've had the opportunity since to deliver some teaching in military academies and the like, where the people who you're speaking to about who they may and may not kill are people who will actually uh, be on the pointy end of things. Um, so I suppose I would say that that's um, the discomfort that I've, uh, that this engendered uh, is, is um, is, is built into the fabric of this book, and this book is an attempt to work it out. Now, this discomfort um, was first made manifest by some holiday reading, um, probably about 10 years ago at this point. I first read John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, as I say, only about, about 10 years ago. Um, I love the book, um, and like a lot of people, I suppose, I found myself stuck on the question of whether George was right to kill Lenny. Um, on the one hand, I could see that George's act of killing was a self-giving act of love, tragic but true. Um, George did not wish to kill Lenny, but he felt obliged to in order to preserve some kind of modicum base level of justice. And the way he undertook the task, uh, the grisly task was designed to minimize the pain that Lenny would feel, to keep it within bounds, and it was carried out with remorse, with regret, um, with an attempt to contain rather than spread or escalate violence. Viewed in this light then, George's killing of Lenny perfectly encapsulates the, uh, the logic of the Augustinian just war. On the other hand, I couldn't but see how base, how pointless, how miserable it was. George killing Lenny didn't make the world a better, happier, more peaceful place. It merely perpetuated the cycle of wretched violence that diminishes everyone. Everyone is unhappy at the end of the book. Lenny's dead and George is broken. After sitting with this for a little while and giving it, uh, giving it a, a short period to order my thoughts, I think I decided that George's killing of Lenny could be both of these things. And perhaps more to the point, 
that when it comes to how we think about political violence, uh, extrapolating from this, the idea of just war might be a part of the solution, might be a part of the solution, but it's also definitely a part of the problem. So the book we're talking about today is an attempt to probe that doubleness and to push down and thereby figure out um, the discomfort we might feel when thinking about ideas of justice in relation uh, to war. As I mentioned in the preface uh, to the book, the idea for it uh, first came to me in St. Andrews. Tony Lang and the late Nick Ranger had invited me to a workshop in their department on Larry, Larry May's excellent um, book, which was still forthcoming at the time on News Post Bellum, that is Justice After War. The book's title was After War Ends, and it engages questions of how do we think about justice in relation to the termination phase or the ending of war. Musing on the notion of the ending of a war and how we define it, um, which was something which seemed to be tripping all of us in the room up, I suggested that instead of talking about ending or terminations or conclusions, we just plug in the terms that we all think about, uh, in which we think about war anyway, victory and defeat, and start from there. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to deny, and I'm pretty sure that it was a daft suggestion, but I think it was also an interesting one. Not interesting because of what it suggested, or how I meant it, but interesting on account of the reaction it, uh, it prompted around the room. Everyone was in agreement. It was a boneheadedly stupid proposal, idiotic. Everyone <laughs> took, took their turn to, to shoot it down. So what shocked me about this was not that people thought it was a bad idea. I, I was aware of that myself. No, rather what shocked me was that they were unanimous on this. So having been in enough academic seminars to recognize that if you ask two academics a question, you'll get three points of view, um, I was very surprised to see a group uh, agree so wholeheartedly on something and to agree so emphatically upon it. So mindful of that, I thought that there must be something going on there and that it would be interesting to look into it. And that's where the book starts. Um, it asks why just war theorists have a problem with victory? Why are they so opposed to talking in this term? What is it about the concept of victory, in other words, that they are so allergic to, so disturbed by? I won't summarize the book here, rather I'll skip straight through to the argument or to the answer. So, spoiler alert, the answer I arrive at in the book is that thinking about just war in light of victory reveals the harsh truth that, to to quote Ken Booth, just war is just war, by which I mean just war is nothing special, it's merely just another form of political violence, just as brutish as any other kind of war. But where some just war theorists see the fact that victory reveals this about just war as a reason for avoiding the concept of victory, I argue the opposite, that it's a reason for engaging it, confronting it. Uh, by grappling with victory, I conclude, just war theorists will come face to face with the tragic character of war. It will prevent us, I think, from ever forgetting that, that just war is not a solution to the ills of the world, um, or not exclusively a, a solution to the ills of the world, but a symptom of them. This should not, however, uh, be taken as a case for quietism or for throwing the idea of just war out the window, for giving up on it. The source of its limitations is I suggest also the very same reason why we need it. So I'm happy to leave it there because I think the most interesting part of the session is going to be um, what Faye and Neil have to say and of course the questions from the audience. So thank you very much for listening and for either getting up early or for staying late to join us. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, we're gonna have two responses now. The first is coming from Faye Donnelly. Uh, Faye grew up in Dublin, Ireland, um, and she is at the moment a lecturer in the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She writes about security and securitization politics and how it appears in places uh, where I at least don't expect it. 
Her publications include a book, Securitization and the Iraq War, The Rules of Engagement in World Politics, uh, which came out with Routledge in 2013, and a large number of articles, including the following, The Queen's Speech, Desecuritizing the Past, Present, and Future of Anglo-Irish Relations, Reframing the Olympic Games as a Space of Contestation Rather than a Fixed Place of Peace, Uncovering New Spatial Stories of Desecuritization, and a tale of two currencies talking about money and desecuritizing moves in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. Faye, I'm really very glad that you can be here tonight. So I'd like to also begin by saying thanks to everybody at the Independent Social Research Foundation. So Chris, Lars and Stuart, who've just been so helpful um, in organizing the event, but also for inviting me to be part of this really, really cool panel. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining us. So even though we can't see you, we know that you're there and it's really nice to have so many people here to discuss um, the book. I also want to begin by really congratulating Keen on the book. Um, to be honest, this is one of the best academic books I've ever read, um, period. If you can just take that as my main message, that's it. From page one to page 151, Keane presents a powerful case for why we need to pay attention to victory in just war theory, but also beyond. For me, a major strength of the book is that Keane doesn't shy away from really difficult questions. Instead, he openly acknowledges and engages with some of the toughest criticisms that might actually be leveled against him as he makes this argument. And I find that really refreshing. So as he just mentioned here, his continued conversation with Ken Booth and the claim that just war is just a war was very reflexive, but it also added a critical edge to the conversation for me. I also loved how clearly Keane's own narrative voice and insights guide the entire text. Um, commanding this level of authority as an author takes a lot of skill, but also a lot of talent. More than that, it requires you to have complete understanding of an issue. So to be able to take really complex ideas and make them accessible is a really big skill that plays out in this book. Anyone who knows Keane or anyone who's read this book will also know that he is a leading expert, so that's not a surprise. But I really think that the way that he makes the debates accessible to non-experts will allow this book to have a lot of reach, but also for me highlights how much academic excellence is in this text. And finally, I want to give Keane a lot of accreditation for the way he grounds all his theoretical points in extensive empirical vignettes. So again, this level of research is actually quite close to perfect, even if there is one small typo <laughs> that you mentioned. Um, so for me, um, just to begin, this book is a masterpiece. And I hope it will generate a lot of conversations, hopefully even starting today in the Q&A. So really well done, Dean. It's a brilliant book. So I'd like to use the rest of my time to try to spark some conversation, to ask four main questions. I'm not sure I got the memo of them being softball, but I'll try, <laughs> I'll try my best to keep them brief. So first, um, the book. Um, applied this idea of thinking with history. You actually introduced that on page 14. And in the main text, there's several fascinating accounts of victory parades, rituals, trophies, and so on. So I wanted today to raise a question around how this theme of thinking with history weaves all the chapters together. And more than that, how does this book then deal with questions of memory and commemoration, including everyday spaces like school curriculum or even museum exhibitions? So that's my first big question. How does this idea of thinking with history connect all the chapters, but also open up conversations around memory and commemoration, maybe in everyday spaces? My second question, and again, just playing on the strengths of the book, is that Keane analyzes peace and war simultaneously. And in doing so, he really encourages us to think very seriously about striking the right balance between peace and war. And also again, acknowledging that these are often conflicting 
that they often don't overlap in neat ways. And for someone who's not a just war theorist, I'm kind of asking this question, maybe from the wrong foot. So again, in the audience part, please feel free to push back. But I just wondered from the outside looking in, if this challenge of striking a balance between peace and war is not going to be very difficult for you as just war theorists. So, okay, it's this eternal circle that can't be squared as Keane notes in the book. But in just war theory, you also treat these things as different, or at least for the sake of argument today, you tend to separate them into different moments, the before, during, and after war. So I wonder today, or maybe somebody else in the audience can come in on this, if a little more could be said on how Keane's book pushes, but also transcends reified boundaries around use ad bellum, use in bello, use post bellum or use ex bello, right? So when I read your book, I really felt like victory also transcends these categories that are such a heartbeat in that tradition. So I just wonder if your argument um, might be unpacked. My third big question, I hope that's okay, King. If I'm going too fast, you can tell me. Um, my third big question is, I couldn't shake this idea of contestation as I read your book. Partly because you discuss it in a really cool way throughout the manuscript. But I wanted to hear a little bit more about who actually has the power to contest victory. And if claiming victory is a powerful speech act or even a desecuritizing move, then which audiences must accept it, right? So in the text, there's a lot of work around the language of victory. And I'm just wondering who actually has to accept the claim of victory and if it can be contested. And my third part of this question is, what happens when victory claims are contested in ways that cannot be resolved by just war theories or even by international war crime tribunals? So contestation of victory might be a little bit bigger than maybe it's given credit for in the text or at least the way I read the text. So that's my third question is how does who contests victory? If it's a powerful speech act, who must accept it? And what happens when victory is contested in ways that can't be resolved by just war theory or even uh, international war crime tribunals? And this is my final sort of big question for setting this up, and then I'll hand it over to Neil and the audience. I know why you've done it because you only have 80,000 words or whatever amount of words you had. But I felt like your argument actually has a lot to offer other debates in IOR beyond the just war theory. So I just wondered, and I'm not expecting you to have perfect answers, but what would happen if we take your insights about victory into different fields of war? So how could it be applied to the idea of cyber war, which you hint at in chapter five, or drone warfare, which again is hinted at in chapter six? And then some of my favorite work at the minute is taking place in critical military studies, which looks at the sensory aspects of war. So how would your argument fit into that debate? So when I read your chapter three, the smell of napalm in the morning, I sort of thought of Kevin McSorley's work where he's actually really talking about the smell of warfare and how might that kind of change the discussion. And again, sort of more forward looking questions here could be you use a lot of historical examples, but actually could it be relevant for more contemporary events? So how does the discussion of police brutality that you talk about in chapter four, maybe speak to current events like the Black Lives Matter movement or events in Hong Kong, Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, just to name a few examples. So yeah, how does your argument speak to not historical case studies, but maybe contemporary case studies? So that's really it. Um, I'll close here. I very much look forward to the discussion that will follow, especially since Keane's book is an invitation to create conversations rather than close them down. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was really, that was very helpful. Um, our second commentator is Neil Rennick, who received his PhD uh, in 2018 from the University of Queensland in Australia. 
where he also lectured in international security and peace and conflict analysis. His doctoral work addressed the moral right to kill in war and the extent to which this right is challenged by the growing capability of certain states to kill with little or no physical risk to their own forces. He is currently a researcher at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy in Hamburg, Germany. There he is part of the Arms Control and Emerging Technologies Project, which focuses on the changing character of war and the ethical and legal regulation of armed conflict. He also works on historical misconceptions of technology and their enduring role in shaping our understanding and governance of war. In addition to a number of articles, including a gardener's vision, unmanned aerial vehicles and the dehumanization of violence. He has recently published a book, Asymmetric Killing, Risk Avoidance, Just War and the Warrior Ethos, out with Oxford University Press in 2020. Neil, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for stopping by. Uh, I'm genuinely honoured to be able to speak about Kean's new book, Victory, the Triumph and Tragedy of Just War. Uh, to put it far too briefly, I loved this book. Firstly, and I think close to most importantly, it was a joy to read. It was interesting, engaging and accessible. I love it when you can actually hear the distinct voice of the author in the book you're reading, and this was certainly that. Uh, in terms of content, I won't add too much to what's already been said, Faye's terrific input, um, but I will note that the book touched upon and helped clarify many of the issues I'm currently grappling with in my own work on technology, specifically the role of techno-optimism and our understanding and practice of war. When working on these issues, I'm often struck by just how unmoored so much of this techno-optimism actually is from a serious consideration of ends uh, take armed drones, for example. We have this zombie myth, most recently revivified by the Azerbaijan-Armenian -Ar conflict of drones as the ultimate game changer, technological silver bullets that enable those in power to secure clean, comprehensive, and final victory. And when I read these accounts, particularly the more breathless versions, I'm reminded again of how necessary it is to actually follow Kean's advice and interrogate what victory actually means and should actually mean in the context of war. Now, too often victory is this vague and hollow thing, it's, you know, synonymous with, victory, uh, with success, but empty of virtually everything else. And without a richer understanding of history, it's very hard to answer a lot of necessary questions, including what are we willing to do or sacrifice in order to secure it? And just as importantly, what aren't we willing to do? What aren't we willing to sacrifice? And the reason for this incuriosity can be guessed. To properly consider victory as Kean does, victory in war, particularly just war, is to quickly realize how high the cost of it really is, at least the type of victory the morally serious should want. Too high a price for many. So the alternative too often is to simply jettison such difficult thinking, reimagine victory in simple, technologically achievable terms, the, the tabulation of enemy dead or some other crude metric. Uh, Kian's book really helped me make sense of all of this and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, so look, I don't know if this is considered gauche, uh, but go buy this book, everyone listening to me. <laughs> it's genuinely excellent. It's a thoughtful and novel and necessary inquiry into an important and underserved aspect of the just war tradition. Okay, with that out of the way, onto the roast, not really. Uh, in the spirit of brevity, I'm gonna restrict myself to one more comment and a single question regarding Kean's understanding of tragedy and its relationship with just war. Uh, Kean, you suggest correctly in my opinion that the reluctance of contemporary just war theorists to properly engage the concept of victory derives at least partly from an unwillingness to recognize the tragic dim uh, dimensions of just war. First of all, I agree. Victory is a fraught concept, particularly when pursued by those committed to just cause and conduct in war. And tragedy or a, um, a tragic recognition clarifies this fact. Tragedy reiterates the salience of the moral dilemma, challenges that defy easy diagnosis and resolution, 
It reminds us that the relationship between justice and suffering is an uneasy one, and that virtuous intention, uh, unmoored from prudence, can actually be more destructive than outright malice. And above all, it cautions us to tread lightly for the world in general and the battlefield specifically is more complex and untamable than we know. These are all critically important lessons for me, particularly in the context of war and your book illuminates each of them terrifically. So congratulations, genuinely well done. Uh, but I do think some mild caution is needed. As you write, the language of just is seductive, uh, but so too, I would argue, is the language of tragedy. It's likely true, as you write, that while war might be employed for a higher purpose, it can never transcend its own base nature. However, I think this lesson can be over-internalized to a degree that induces a fatalistic paralysis, a resignation that all wars, no matter our noble intent or the noble intent of their architects, inevitably lead to unacceptably ruinous ends. And I think two problems can come from this, this marination in tragedy. It can firstly distract us from the fact that for all the horrors of war, it may at times be the only tool we have available to avert something worse. The tragedy of war, uh, the tragedy of war may be worth enduring and inflicting, for example, if it alleviates the crime of genocide, to protect states worth protecting in self-defense. But secondly, and I think just as importantly, uh, I think an overemphasis on just war as tragedy can blunt rather than enhance our moral sensibilities. Like take the Western air war against ISIS in 2014, a conflict that produced an incredibly high level of collateral civilian death. Now it is possible to, train, uh, to frame this as the tragic consequence of war's inability to transcend its own base nature. But I don't necessarily think that's the most useful lens. The collateral damage in that conflict was not tragically high, it was foreseeably and avoidably high, you know, perhaps criminally high. I think we sometimes focus on tragedy and war to a degree that obscures just how much of it can be restrained by changes in policy or shifts in preference or through deeper reflection on our responsibilities as belligerents. There is in other words, a risk that the tragic recognition can impede rather than facilitate the kind of moral action we wanna see in war. Now, it's very important to stress here, but I think your actual engagement with tragedy in this book is remarkably nuanced. I don't think you drown in it or marinate in it, it sounds odd. Um, in fact, I think you offer an excellent counterbalance to those who do. Uh, but I think the risk is there nevertheless. I think this book is a triumph and befitting the Roman triumphs that you write about. Um, perhaps you can see me as the slave whispering in your ear, advising caution reminding you that yes, just war is tragedy, but it's not only tragedy and must never become only tragedy. So in the context of this creepy slavish whispering, I'll ask my question. Uh, in practical terms, how does our approach to just war and unjust war change with greater recognition of its tragic dimensions? Or does it? Okay, that's me done. I thought it was wonderful. Um, Kian, is back to you for a um, brief response, and then we will turn it over to the, uh, to the audience. There's a lot to take in there. That, those comments are really rich. So thanks uh, both uh, Faye and Neil so much. Um, where to start? I'll try and work through those. I won't take too long with them. I'll, I'll move nice and swiftly or as swiftly as I can through them. Um, so Faye asked about the vignettes in the book and about um, what was the rationale or the logic behind um, behind their inclusion and how they were how they were cashed out, as it were. So what I was hoping to do, uh, the, the form the book took is that after sitting down and being told that victory was a very bad idea and that just war theorists should never think about it, I investigated, I guess, the reasons uh, why just war theorists think it's such a bad idea. And I arrived at seven reasons uh, um, why just war theorists are so keen to avoid victory. And those are the reasons that I, and I, I then devoted each uh, a chapter apiece to each of those reasons in the book. And that's, that's generally the form the book takes. 
what I was hoping to do then with that was to um, uh, pick a different historical vignette and thinker, which allowed us to kind of crystallize and show us how that problem manifested itself in actual, uh, in the evolution of the just war tradition and also in the um, practical material realities it was seeking to engage with. Uh, and further to that, there was an attempt, as it were, to um, select different vignettes and thinkers from different periods, so that when read as a piece, each of these cases um, uh, can be aggregated to offer a kind of a, shall we say, some kind of critical history of the just war tradition from Cicero right up to the present day. Um, so that was the thinking behind that, as to whether it succeeded or not, I'm not entirely sure, but um, the best part about it, I guess, was that um, uh, the vignettes were a lot of fun to write and a lot of fun to research. Um, on the subject of commemoration and memory, I think this is really interesting. Um, and I think victory speaks to our need, and the concept of victory speaks to our need for finality and conclusiveness which is, as it were, a prerequisite for commemoration. And uh, there's almost this, um, as, as somebody like um, my friend and colleague Brent Steele will put it, this ontological um, urge or requirement to find finality. So the battles and the, the contestation over victory is an essential prelude to those kind of culture wars about how we commemorate particular wars. And I'd be happy to say more about that Kind of stuff as we as we go. On the subject of how just war tradition breaks down into these kind of um, component parts, yus ad bellum, in bello, post bello, ex bello, post bellum, and how it cashes out war in this very sequential linear way, which um, almost does violence to the interconnectedness of the topic, an interconnectedness which I think victory helps destabilize. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Faye. Um, my sense is that uh, part of the problem with just war thinking is that these are heuristic devices, they're analytic categories, but when you use them enough times, they reify into something harder and become mistaken for actual historical or empirical categories, such that there is a different phase of war, a beginning phase, a contestation phase, um, a conclusion phase. Um, this is a trick the theory pulls on us, um, and it frequently, um, so to speak, pulls our pants down in that regard. And you see this manifest in the um, invasion of Iraq, where part of the problem with the war planning was precisely that it was so sequenced. Um, some of your final queries I'm going to bunch together in terms of you spoke about the contestation of victory uh, and its indeterminacy. I would, in the first instance, I suppose, draw people's attention to, um, well, forthcoming work by Andy Hahn in this general area, but also a very fine book by Dominic Johnson and Dominic Tierney and their associated work in which they talk about how international society um, or how victory and defeat get ascribed in modern war is probably the best way to put it, and how those claims are sometimes contested. It's a very fine book. Um, more generally, the, the, and this speaks also to your Black Lives Matter and your, your police policing question, is I think one of the things that you get at when you start talking about war and just war through the lens of victory is just how little uh, the note, the concept of the practice of war actually works anymore. Um, what I mean by this is that war, so far as it supposedly or ostensibly serves a function, it's as a means of decision, as a means of dispute resolution, um, where you settle it, where you settle an issue, an otherwise intractable issue through duking it out um, and the winner takes all. Now this relies upon, uh, for war to serve this function, it must have some clear way of demarcating who is the winner and who is the loser and when it's over. So when relations uh, return to normal, uh, this was the purpose or the rationale behind all of those um, 
Some of those rituals which you mentioned, like the Roman triumph or the Greek battlefield trophy, they signaled uh, and confirmed who won, who lost, and when a war was over. Uh, the problem today, um, and it's been a problem through a large part of history, is it's perhaps more, I, I would say it's perhaps more, um, it's exacerbated today, but it's always been latent or present or active in some way. Um, is that war lacks such a mechanism uh, uh, of uh, a mechanism for determining when war concludes? There are no battlefield trophies. Uh, there's no there's there's no uh, final whistle for warfare today, and that makes um, the notion of victory even more politically contestable and even more charged. Um, so as it gets more and more difficult to to define, identify, and practice and determine who won, the term still retains its evocative, um, emotive content. Uh, finally, you mentioned some work on, uh, uh, by McSorley on embody, uh, embodiment and experience of war. Um, this stuff sounds fascinating and speaks to some other things I'm currently thinking about and working on. Um, the only work I've engaged really in any way uh, thus far on that is, is a fantastic essay on Scars and Victory by Brent Steele and Luke Campbell. Um, but beyond that, I'm, 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 I'm batting for zero there. Um, Neil, but, but thank you, Faye, those, those comments were super. Um, Neil, uh, thanks so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come at this in two slightly different ways and uh, from two, two angles. And I'll do my best to keep this very brief. Um, so the first, the reason for going this direction and for highlighting tragedy was I was, I became interested for some reason in Ares and Athena and in how they figure in, um, in Homeric uh, myth cycles. Um, Athena seems like the embodiment of the just war tradition. Um, she stands for the possibility, she stands for, among other things, the possibility that war can be ordered and harnessed so that it serves justice and political order. It, it, it can be appropriated by the state for the purposes of ordering civil life. Um, Athena, thus, is one war god, but there is another war god, of course, and that is Ares. And Ares is a much more, is a much blunter character. He's wild, he's untamable, he's entirely idiotic. He runs into gates, he always ends up losing. He trips over his own feet. Uh, he's just brutishly violent and he doesn't care who he's fighting for or what ends it serving so long as he's fighting. So viewing it today through our kind of lens, one of the temptations is to ask, well, which one really is it and who usurps you and do they exist in some kind of dialectical relation or something of this? Does Athena, you know, transcend Ares? And I think, you know, when you go back to um, the Greek way of viewing things, I think they always necessarily existed together alongside one another, each balancing the other. So, um, the impulse towards ordering war must also account for the fact that war is in some residual way fundamentally unorderable. Um, Ares will always come with Athena. Um, Ares will always beget Athena um, and you, you can't pull them apart. So that's what I was trying to get at there, I suppose. As for what kind of lesson you take forward with this or how you carry this forward, the main thing I was hoping to achieve, I suppose, was to kind of undercut or to remind people to, to remind just war theorists to be reflexive about the limits of their perspective and the problematic nature of their perspective. Um, there's a certain natural seductiveness or pomposity about just war language. And there, there has to be. If you are wishing to convince people that it's right and proper to send young men and women to kill and be killed and to, to kill people and destroy things. You have to have a good reason for doing this. You have to be able to promise that this is going to be worth their while, that the sacrifice will yield um, uh, benefits that are worth the pain. And so this kind of language of justice can sometimes 
um, I suppose, what would you say, be blown up almost to vindicate or validate that effort. Um, it, it fulfills a psychological need. It's easy then when you play that game to lose sight of the fact that war usually delivers modest, limited goals. Yes, it can um, apply a balm to some of the problems of the world, but it's not a solution to them. It, it, it never resolves issues. It, it contains them, uh, minimizes them perhaps, or delays them or defers them, um, but it doesn't resolve them. And so the language of tragedy is a useful kind of reminder there in that fact. I, I'm minded, by the way, I should say two, two things on uh, two further points, and I'll conclude. Um, I'm, I'm minded to think of the IDF strategy of mowing the lawn um, as, a, as, a, as a point of reference here. Um, instead of something like Woodrow Wilson's War to End All Wars or you know, War to Make the World Safe for Democracy, um, the IDF is very clear with Israeli, uh, the Israeli population that when they go into Gaza, it is to minimize or contain a problem for a year or two or three, um, fully aware and, and, and that they will have to go back in and again and again and again, and that anything that they do in that space is only ever going to be provisional, piecemeal, partial, and wholly dissatisfactory. And I have my problems with that point of view and with that way of talking about war, especially with the dehumanizing character of it. Um, the notion of mowing the lawn seems um, hugely callous and, 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 and worrying to me. But what I do appreciate about it in a, in a backward kind of way is how honest it is about what war can deliver. There is a kind of a sober realism there, which um, leaves no space for the kind of illusions that just war can deliver um, milk and honey forever. Um, and I think there's something in that that we can actually take away. But um, I, I just saw on the list of uh, participants here that I think Tom Hooper is here. Tom Hooper is writing a really interesting PhD at King's College London on critical approaches to just war. And um, Tom, uh, I think, has a far more interesting take on tragedy and the limits of it and how we engage it than I do. So I don't know, perhaps Tom uh, will, will chip in during Q&A. Um, but otherwise, I would just direct you to, to read his work because it's, uh, it, it's pretty neat, pretty interesting. And it engages Jeremy Clarkson, which is never a good thing, but he makes it work. Um, so yeah, thank you. I just, I have to say though, my one sentence summary of your book is um, that the problem with just war theory is it does not discredit war enough. In other words, that it's always kind of keeping war in play as something that we could do and that it, instead of confining it, it's, it's reinserting it, revalidating it in, in these complex. I mean, that's just as, you know, some of the outside, I, mean, I thought that you worked through that incredibly well and the, the clarity and the, the brevity of the, your engagement with particular influential arguments. I mean, Michael Walzer in two pages, Carl Schmidt in two pages, it was really, it was kind of phenomenal. So anyway, there's, there's a more, um, there's a lot more here. So I'm gonna start with, with uh, the first question. Uh, Michael Davies uh, wrote the following, which is actually <laughs> overlaps a bit with what I just said. Your book, Victory, speaks on the non-utility of victory. That is, it has little pertinence to the military realities of modern war. This is something you say on page 124. Yet only recently, Azerbaijan won a decisive victory over Armenia in the Karabakh War. Assad has won a decisive yet incomplete and messy victory in the Syrian civil war. Hamas achieved a decisive victory in the 2007 Battle of Gaza, just to name a few. Why should we declare victory an invalid concept instead of pointing out that Anglo-American militaries and many of their allies and partners, and here's the twist, are intentionally designed to achieve strategic failure? That's the first of 10. Do you want, do you want me to line a couple of these up or do you want? Yeah, please. And, and actually, if you could just reiterate, what was the last sentence about strategic failure? 
why should we declare victory an invalid concept instead of pointing out that Anglo-American militaries and many of their allies and partners are intentionally designed to achieve strategic failure? Okay. A second question comes from Beatrice um, Hooser. Uh, for Kean, do you think that the link between justice and victory is peculiar to the metaphysically spoken Western world that has emerged from the European just war tradition? And then I'll give you a third one as well. Do you get that one? Yeah, thank you. Third is from Francisco Lobo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rodrisco. My question to you is, does your book touch on the connection between the elusive benchmark of victory and the responsibility to rebuild dimension of responsibility to protect? Okay. The connection between the elusive benchmark of victory and the responsibility to rebuild. Those are the first three. Okay. Um, well, those are those are very interesting, very tough questions. Um, <laughs> Michael, thanks so much. Um, I don't know that I have anything at all um, smart or interesting to say in response, except that I look forward to to exchanging notes uh, with you about that if if you're if you're interested. Um, for what it's worth, I find it fascinating. One of, one of the comments I frequently heard um, from military people is that actually I'm, I'm, I'm wrong that militaries don't use the language victory and defeat, um, that this is not how people in the armed forces tend to think about the conclusion of warfare and so on and so forth, um, that they use a whole different set of categories and, 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 and concepts. But curiously, um, when you read war memoirs, um, this language nevertheless recurs in that setting. And it seems to, almost despite itself or despite the author, order a large part of the author's moral evaluation of their role in warfare. Um, so regardless, I, I guess what I'm doing is I'm wrestling your question away from the Yusad Bellum level to the Yusin Bellow level and saying, while militaries may be built for strategic failure, on, on an ad bellum level, if that's, if that's one way of putting it. Uh, nevertheless, how soldiers and those who partake in war make moral sense of what they're doing and what's being asked of them is frequently through the lens or through the, through the prism of victory, or at least that's a large part of it. Um, as for the death of decisive victory and the fact that we still do occasionally see um, decisive victories or things that look like them in the world. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think that this is a hard topic to write about without overstating one's claims or getting drawn to some degree into some kind of polemical point of view about whether victory is possible or not in modern war. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say I imagine I overstate things at some point uh, and get things wrong at others, but um, asking these questions, or, or I'm just happy to be asking those questions and to be provoking those kind of, um, those queries. Beatrice, um, lovely to see you, sort of. Um, victory and just war in the Western slash non-Western tradition. Um, I can't speak in any informed way to, its, to the relation in non-Western traditions. But I can say that the relation between victory and just war takes a very particular form in the Western tradition. Um, I'll draw attention very briefly, I'll do my best to keep this succinct, to one of the vignettes that didn't really make it into the book. As you well know, Beatrice, there, the Greeks had their battlefield trophies, which were a cruciform shape and which signified uh, that a battle had been won. The Romans incorporated replicas of those battlefield trophies in their Roman triumphs uh, and, and uh, included them in their battlefield standards. So they marched into battle behind replicas of battlefield trophies to signify that they were, they were sure to be victorious and the gods would support them. Now, where this gets interesting is that on the eve of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, 
uh, the Emperor Constantine or the soon to be Emperor Constantine sees a sign in the sky. It's a burning cross. Um, apologies, there's a bus going by behind me. Um, there's a, he sees a burning cross in the sky with the sign, through me conquer. Um, Constantine takes this as a sign to convert to Christianity and he, uh, he immediately calls his generals to his camp where he orders them to rework the battlefield standards where instead of just having a, uh, a symbol of a battlefield trophy on the standards, there would also be a Christian cross inscribed over the top of them. So what you get is this melding together of notions of victory with Christian notions of sacrifice and redemption such that victory becomes not just about what happens on the field of battle, but it becomes about piety, devotion to God, overcoming sin, ending evil, and so on and so forth. And this opens up some interesting space for the kind of work that you've done, Beatrice, I think, on moral victories, and on how we can recast even defeat as a kind of victory, um, because, of course, it's... Um, symptomatic of a faith even if we lose on the battlefield if we fight purely and truly we are doing god's work and we will be we will get our rewards in heaven so to speak so all of that's just to say that there is a very uh, th there's a there's a political theology to use will bain's term um well not will bain's term but a, but a term preferred by will bain of victory of the relationship between victory and just war that's uh, very particularly Western. I'm sure there are analogs in other cultural traditions. I'm not aware of, I, I don't know them though. Uh, Francisco, thank you so much. Um, my colleague and partner on the Moral Victories Project, Kurt Mills, wrote somewhat about the relationship between victory and R2P missions and responsibility to rebuild. Um, I won't be able to say anything that adds to his work. What I would um say is if we draw that over into kind of just war terrain uh, the responsibility to rebuild largely falls under the use post bellum bracket of just war thinking so falling foul of phase notion phase warning about not uh, overly uh, compartmentalizing just war reasoning here we go um the problem well, one of the quirks with use postbellum reasoning is that it takes the fact of victory as a starting point, and it presumes that there's clarity over who is the victor and who is the loser. That the starting question, the pivot question for use postbellum bellum analysis is, what does the victor of a just war owe the vanquished party? What are its responsibilities to the society it has defeated? This assumes that we already know who has won and who has lost, uh, and that the war is even over in any clear-cut way, which, as we know from recent history, Michael's question notwithstanding, is usually something which is far from clear and usually part of the conflict itself. Um, so I find, um, I find that a very interesting facet of just postbellum analysis and where these kind of questions take place within just war theorizing, and I think um, the notion of victory destabilizes them, I suppose, in a, in a, in a helpful way or unhelpful way, possibly. Uh, that's, that's probably the best I can do for now, but I'm happy to exchange notes and emails and so on. All right, thanks, Ken. We have, um, I'll give you three more. This is from Chris, Chris Brown. Ken, great book, congratulations. Would your concern with just war theory be at least partly met by turning just war into justified war, which doesn't have the implication that war is a good thing, and theory, which implies a set of answers into tradition, yeah. which suggests a set of questions. Yeah. Okay, got that? Yeah. Second, um, it's from Tony Lang. Great book and great comments from Faye and Neil. Kean, I wouldn't normally put this in these terms, but from a Nietzschean perspective, is the just war worry about victory related to the Judeo-Christian idea of humility? That is, might winning be something that morally good people should not seek, but rather other normative goals? Yeah. That's Tony Lang. And then from Phil Vernon, 
Isn't victory an intrinsic part of just war theory anyway, given that wars are so often, if not always, fought with a goal of victory? Yeah. Okay. Those okay. Are the next Thanks ones. so much. Um, and we have several more after that. Okay, well, lovely to hear from friends. Um, nice nice to, to be chatting with you, um, albeit in a mediated way. Um, Chris, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, I'd be happy, I'm happy you're talking about justified or justifiable war or use of force rather than just war. I'm certainly happy you're talking about tradition rather than theory um, for the reasons uh, you suggest. And I suppose one of the things that this uh, indicates is that Faye and Neil's nice comments notwithstanding, the book in, in many ways doesn't do anything all that new. This is the restatement of a very conventional, depressive account of just war thinking that <laughs> we've all, we're all already familiar with, but it's just so easy to stray away from because it doesn't offer you any, shall we say, emotional or cathartic release. It's not a very satisfactory or it's not a morally satisfying um, or an emotionally satisfying discourse. It, it leaves you um, feeling that something is missing or that you've, uh, you've not been vindicated. Sorry, I'm, I'm waffling, but I think the point I'm, I'm trying to make there is um, this is just a statement of a classic kind of just war view, albeit that classic view is frequently obscured and moved away from, especially in contemporary discourse, where we see more and more, um, shall we say, liberal hawkish accounts of just war theorizing, uh, which forget its um, its limits. Uh, Tony, uh, fascinating. Um, glad to see you're finding your Nietzsche. Um, what would I say to that? I, I think I, I think I agree with you. And so we. In response to Francisco a moment ago, we spoke about use post bellum. Um, I'm sure you're, you'll already be aware of this, but the, the foundation article of the use post bellum discourse is, um, is, a, is a lovely essay in Christian Century by Michael J. Schutt, who was a Jesuit, I believe. Um, and I think the piece was called When the Shooting Stops. Um, and it was Schuck who proposed, we need a category to think about ethics at the end of war. And what provoked him to write this essay was the victory parades, uh, redolent of Roman triumphs that took place in the aftermath of Gulf War I. One of which was down Main Street, Disneyland, with General Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf dancing in front of the band, right down Main Street, Disneyland. And Schuck wrote this wonderful essay called When the Shooting Stops, and he said, you know, we may have won, but this is nothing to celebrate. Um, that this, is, this is a sad time. It's better that we won than lost, but, but this is an occasion for solemn reflection rather than jubilation. Um, and I think that captures something of the mordant tone uh, of, that I appreciate in, in just war thinking. On the point that victory isn't the end of just war, um, isn't the end of just war thinking properly understood, but rather peace or some other notion like that is. This, I, I suppose I just pat that back by saying this is something I try to engage with in the book in one of the early chapters, um, where I pick up on Marty Atasari's point, um, uh, you know, you can either choose, you, you can choose peace or you can choose to win. Um, and play about with that and how it works out around the Versailles Peace Conference and in relation to, um, to just war thinking. But thank you. Um, Phil uh, asked a question about whether victory is already intrinsic in some way or in, to just war reasoning. Yes, absolutely. And that's something I thought about speaking about today but I, but I went a different direction. When I started looking at victory and why just war theorists are so, as I put earlier, uh, not disposed to it, what I found and what really intrigued me was this notion that victory is both essential to the idea of just war, insofar as you don't wage a just war 
except to win it. And if you can afford not to win it, it's not a war you should be fighting. Ergo, it's not a just war. So the notion of victory is essential and integral internal to the very just war idea. Um, but it's also obviously in tension with it insofar as if you're playing to win, it encourages you to set the rules aside. You know, playing to win and genders playing dirty. Um, so I was fascinated by this notion that victory is both uh, essential to, but also in tension with the idea of just war. And it almost seemed like the ghost in the machine, you know, a, a glitch. Um, is it is it a is it a feature of the system? Is it a bug in the system, or is it a feature of the system? That was the kind of question I was interested in getting at. Um, yeah. So thank you. Really, really interesting questions. Great. Thanks, Ken. We only have time for three more, and I really I want to apologize to the folks that are still in the queue. Um, first is of the last three is from Luke Cahill. Uh, for uh, does our focus on victory not reveal our unquenchable desire for certainty? Does this not show that we cannot escape the hope or belief that our situation is new and different and that we will never stop believing in victory? That's you got that, Ken. Yep. Next is from uh, Benjamin Tallis. Uh, great discussion. I look forward to reading the book. Picking up on one of Neil Rennick's comments on the complex and untamable nature of the battlefield. What about those who do not choose war, but have it thrust upon them by being attacked, for example, and must nonetheless negotiate this wild uncertainty? Should they not seek victory? And then from Valerie Markovicius, Thank you all for this wonderful discussion. Kian, I'm wondering whether you think that perhaps some of the discomfort we have these days about victory isn't only a loss of faith in the idea that the right side always wins, or even the tragic sense that victory in war is nonetheless a loss for humanity, but perhaps also a fundamentally modern worry about justice itself. In other words, are we moderns perhaps less sure about what justice is and this lack of moral certainty that makes victory, um, thus makes victory and the implicit triumph of justice uh, makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. No, I mangled that a bit. Did you get it, get, get the gist? Yes, yes, I think so. And if I don't, I'll just blame you. <laughs> okay. um, Please do. <laughs> so thanks. And thanks, Luke. I hope all is well in Bath. Um, what I would say to that is yes, I think you're right, that our need and our continual attraction to the language of victory reflects this need for certainty, closure, decisiveness, the ability to draw straight lines between war and peace and to signal when one ends and the other conclude, uh, when one ends and the other begins. Um, I would also say it's, it's kind of, to my view, it appears inescapable. So one of the interesting things is uh, uh, Obama sought to after George W. Bush spoke um, flatulently about victory again and again and again, um, Obama actually sought to move US official discourse away from it and instructed that it be removed from strategic communications, quadrennial defense review, all of that kind of stuff. He wanted to talk about objectives being achieved, uh, limited successes, so on and so forth, but the V word was banned. Um, of course, it never goes away. It's still there. It's just simply recoded, waiting to be picked up again at the next opportune moment. And of course, we all know who followed, um, who followed Obama and how much of a cornerstone in, in, in Trump's presidential campaign and um, whatever followed um, was premised on promises of victory, so much winning that you'll get sick of winning, so on and so forth. Um, so I think this is, kind of nicely illustrates the degree to which um, victory is both too powerful, too emotive, and too fuzzy a term to be able to leave behind for too long. It does too much work politically um, uh, for us to, to be able to, to leave it behind or work around it. Um, ben, that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about it like that. I suppose this reflects some of the limits of just war thinking. 
you know, as Michael Walzer puts it, um, I don't think we've mentioned Walzer this evening, so that's unusual. Anyway, first mention for Walzer, an hour and 15 minutes in. Um, Walzer talks about just what theory is the language of the powerful. You know, this is ethics from the position of those who are wielding force, from the perspective, through the eyes of the men with the guns, so to speak. Um, so to the degree that we don't often view it through the lens of the attacked or the defeated or the loser, I think this uh, this is a structural, um, uh, this, this reflects something structural about just war theory. I would nevertheless say that I don't, I don't suppose, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be attempting to argue that we excise victory from our vocabulary and that people shouldn't be fighting for victory. It's just more to say that actually if you open victory up as a site of political contestation and to see what is actually being claimed, what is being fought for, what are the desired end goals, that um, this is a very, um, that there's a lot going on there that we can, uh, it reveals a lot of interesting dynamics. So I fully expect uh, and imagine that any side, whether you know, they initiated the fighting or are responding, will fight for victory, um, or will fight for something approximating victory. But what that means and, and how that cashes out and how we understand that in ethical terms, those are the kind of questions I'm interested in and how they reflect back on the ethical categories that we use to adjudicate war or to evaluate war. Um, but thank you, really, really interesting. Um, Val, uh, thank you, and nice to, Nice to chat. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think this, you know, does represent a certain loss of faith. Um, I don't know that I've anything more to add than your question. Um, I think your question says it nicely, but I think a nice illustration of this or illumination of this is that when even Tony Lang is quoting Nietzsche, um, God must really be dead and us just war theorists must have to find a different set of anchorages and foundations from which to speak. Um, so I think you do capture something of what's going on, uh, capture something of what's happening in the water with that question. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and yeah, apologies for speaking so long that I didn't get to some of the other questions that uh, Chris suggested are there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry too, and I, I we are going to preserve them and pass them on to Kian, and because um, I, I think there are things that he'll want to continue to address. Uh, there's a particular a kind of an overlapping theme that I think is particularly interesting and important, uh, which is applicability of just war theories uh, from the perspectives of official en enemies of the West, and then also in a context in which. Uh, for example, the US has been bombing Iraq for 30 years. Does just war theory say anything about possible accountability for such atrocities? So there's a, I feel like we're just scratching the surface here of the, uh, you know, the importance of the topic and the work that, that you're doing and that you, Faye and Neil are also doing on this. Um, I really wanna thank you for your input. Uh, conversation to be continued on all these topics Thank you to the audience for coming and for asking such excellent questions. Um, hopefully we will see you next month. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. See you again soon. Goodbye.